This is lesson 2.2, and today we're going to be talking about early experiments in the development of atomic theory. So our goal today is to understand how atomic theory developed and to be able to determine the numbers of different subatomic particles in different isotopes. I'd like to start off and talk about John Dalton, who was an English scientist, and in 1808 he came up with the first real comprehensive theory of atoms. So the first thing he said was the elements are made up of atoms. And the term atom comes from the Greek, which essentially it means uncuttable. And really, he wasn't the first one to talk about atoms. The term atoms comes all the way back from Greek philosophers more than 2,000 years ago. And they were kind of debating whether matter was made out of elements or made out of atoms. And the idea of atoms was that we could take some kind of material, we could cut it in half, and we can cut it and cut it and cut it and cut it. And if you do that repetitively, at some point in time, you'll come up with a certain part of matter that you can no longer cut. And that would be the smallest part of matter. So that was the original idea of what an atom is. And it turned out that the Greek philosophers were arguing, is matter made of atoms or elements? And John Dalton said, well, no, 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 actually it's both. And he kind of changed the idea of what elements were. And he said elements are made of atoms. Now, atoms of a given element are identical in size, mass, and other properties. So if you're of the same element, all the atoms that make up the element are the same. Atoms of different elements are different. He also said that atoms, kind of similar to the whole Greek idea, he said atoms cannot be divided created or destroyed. So in addition to not being able to cut them up and make them any smaller, also atoms, they can't come out of nowhere. They can't be created and they can't be destroyed. So in a chemical reaction, well, what happens? Things change, right? But what actually happens? So he said in chemical reactions, atoms do what? They combine, separate, or rearrange. And so this is called bonding. So some kind of change in bonding that typically occurs in a chemical reaction. And what we see here are representations of nitrogen and oxygen combining to form nitrogen monoxide. And so we have here nitrogen represented by this red sphere, oxygen by the blue sphere. And when they come together, those spheres overlap and we call that overlapping a bond. So in a chemical reaction, atoms can come together and bond. Bonds can be broken or bonds typically can be rearranged. So you have some bonds break, some bonds form, and that's what happens in a chemical reaction. In addition, he also said that typically your atoms of different elements, they're going to combine in simple whole number ratios. So in this case for NO, we see that's a one-to-one -one ratio of nitrogen and oxygen. You can also have a, let's say, one to two ratio, one to three ratio, two to three ratio, four to one ratio, three to four ratio, but some kind of simple whole number ratio of the different atoms in the molecule. John Dalton was working over 200 years ago, and this was his periodic table of the elements. Right? It's got a lot fewer elements in it, and they also didn't have symbols. It's not a periodic table, it's just a table of elements. Right? We notice here for sulfur, he didn't use the symbol S like we do today. Instead, it was this plus sign in the middle of a circle. Right? For carbon, it was this circle that was kind of shaded in and darkened. So we have all these different symbols for the different elements, but somewhat different from the symbols that we have today. Now, further on, as people continued to investigate the atom, we have in 1874, Sir William Crookes invented the cathode ray tube. Now, a cathode ray tube is simply a high vacuum tube. What does that mean, a high vacuum tube? It means that he took some kind of glass tube, which was empty in the middle, and he sucked out all of the air. Essentially, there was no more air at all inside that tube. And so that's why a cathode ray tube is also known as a vacuum tube. And he did some interesting experiments. This is one of his more sophisticated cathode ray tubes. But he did some interesting experiments. And he found, first of all, that these cathode ray tubes conducted electricity. Whereas if you had air in there, it wouldn't conduct electricity very well. But when you remove the air, now they could actually conduct electricity, which is fairly interesting. And not only did they conduct electricity, but whatever that conduction of electricity was here, 
that it was actually able to cause that paddle wheel to move, which was really, really interesting. Well, how could it cause the paddle wheel to move? If you shined it with a laser, you wouldn't be able to move that thing, right? Light isn't able to move things like that, but this electricity could. So he concluded that these are massive particles. What does that mean? It doesn't mean like really heavy. It means that they are made of particles that had mass. So they weren't massless. They were massive particles. And these particles were coming from the cathode. So he could notice the direction the paddle wheel moved. And he noticed that they were coming from the cathode and they had mass because only massive particles are able to actually move things like that. So very interesting. This cathode ray or this particle that was coming from the cathode was massive. It had mass and was able to move things. So here's another look at a cathode ray too. Basically, the cathode is the negative electrode and an anode is the positive electrode. So the cathode rays were coming out of the negative electrode. And you can also put a fluorescent screen in there. If you don't have any kind of fluorescent material inside a cathode ray tube, you won't be able to see it. But if you put it in there, you can actually see the cathode ray. A fluorescent screen is just some kind of screen with a fluorescent material on it, just like any other fluorescent material. When something shines on it, when light shines on it, or some other energy hits it, it's able to glow. So that fluorescent screen enabled them to visualize that cathode ray, right? We notice that the beam is coming from the negative end, implying that these are negatively charged particles. Also, if you bring a magnet close to the cathode ray tube, you can move that cathode ray around. And so these rays are influenced by a magnet. And Crookes noticed that the way it moves based on the polarity of the magnet implies that these cathode rays are negatively charged. So both the fact that it's coming out of the negative electrode and the fact that it moves in a certain direction based on the polarity of the magnet means that these cathode rays are negatively charged particles. Now, J.J. Thompson also came on the scene and did some more experiments with cathode ray tubes. This down here is one of the cathode ray tubes that he made and used. And what he did was he put an electric and magnetic fields into the cathode ray tube. In this case, we have electric plates being put right there in the cathode ray tube. And he used that to calculate the charge to mass ratio of the cathode ray. Okay, so here's a little closer look at his experiment, right? So here's his cathode ray tube. Here's the cathode, here's the anode. And he was able to get these cathode rays to come out here. And he applied an electric field and was able to bend this cathode ray at will. And so he concluded, first of all, that all atoms contain these particles of the cathode ray. And why is that? Because no matter what material he used for the cathode, whether it was copper, iron, zinc, gold, silver, it didn't matter. Whatever material he used here, his results were all the same, which is pretty interesting, right? Which means that all these different materials, all atoms have these cathode rays in them. Secondly, he also, through his calculations, noticed that the cathode ray was much, much lighter and smaller than atoms, or at least much, much lighter. He didn't actually measure the size of them, but they're much, much lighter than atoms. Later scientists called these cathode rays electrons. And so the whole time these people were discovering and investigating the electron, which is inside the atom. So a cathode ray is an electron. I find it interesting that all this investigation of the atom also led to advances in technology. For example, your very first televisions and computer screens were all made with cathode ray tube technology. So this is here is a diagram of a color television. And back before your time, all televisions and computer screens were not flat, but fairly large, and they all contained vacuum tubes or cathode ray tubes in them. So in this color television, you've got these three different cathode ray tubes that were shooting out electrons and the electrons could be moved using electromagnets and they could be put on any different point on the screen. And you'd cycle through the entire screen and each point could be made red, blue, or green to any varying amount based on how many cathode rays you would allow to come through here. Through changing the amount of red, blue, and green on the screen, you could get any color and you could get any kind of effect you wanted. So cathode ray tubes, 
led to advances in technology, and that's where we got our very first TVs. In 1909, Robert Millikan calculated the exact charge and mass of an electron by measuring the charges of oil droplets. So what he did was he just took some oil and sprayed it in a fine mist. So we got really, really small droplets of oil, which you could see, and gave them a charge. Now, they didn't have a big charge. They had a very, very small charge. And he was able to put them into a uniform electric field and suspend them there or make them move up or make them move down based on what their charge was. He was able to use that uniform electric field to figure out the exact charge of each of those droplets. He did this with hundreds of oil droplets. And then because each droplet was charged and it had a small whole number of electrons, right? It had to have a whole number of electrons. You can't have half an electron. And so by looking at all those hundreds of oil droplet charges, he was able to determine the charge of electron by saying that the smallest difference in charge of the different oil droplets must be the charge of electron because you can't have half of an electron or a third of electron. So the smallest difference in charge must be the charge of an electron. And so he was able to get a very, very accurate measurement of the charge of an electron, which enabled him to also calculate the mass of an electron. And then people used that information to think about the atom. So the very first application of this was known as the plum pudding model for the atom. Right? And so what is this? Basically, people looked and said, okay, the mass of an electron is this. So 9.1 times 10 to the minus 28 grams. And the mass of the smallest and lightest hydrogen is 1.7 times 10 to the minus 24. An electron is nearly 2,000 times lighter than the lightest atom. So what does that mean? So people came up with the idea, well, that must mean the electrons are really small and that most of the mass of the atom is this positively charged mass that balances out the negative charge of the electrons. And it's probably kind of dotted within that large positive mass, right? And so people assumed that the mass referred to also the size. And they basically said, well, if the electrons are so light, they must also be really, really small. And they must be kind of dotted throughout the atom, kind of like raisins in some kind of raisin bread or something. And so they call this plum pudding model, right? This is a picture of some kind of plum pudding that people used to eat and maybe people still do eat. But basically it was this kind of spherical pudding with plums in it that kind of look like raisins, right? So you have these plums that are dotted throughout and they thought the atom looked like that, right? So it's mostly this soft, gooey, positive charge with these plums dotted throughout. That's a nice theory for the atom and they wanted to test it. So in 1910, shortly after Millikan's experiment, Ernest Rutherford decided to test this plum pudding model. And what he did was he shot alpha particles at a very thin sheet of gold foil. Now, alpha particles are essentially atomic level bullets. So they're really, really fast and they're actually fairly massive. So they're more massive than a hydrogen atom. They're basically like a helium atom. They're about the same mass of a helium atom because they're the same as helium nuclei. And they're traveling at close to the speed of light very, very fast. All right. So these alpha particles are like these atomic level bullets and he's shooting them at a thin sheet of gold foil. So if the gold foil is made of atoms, which it is, and if atoms are like plum pudding, then he thought that all of these alpha particles should go straight through the atoms. No problem. Well, what actually happened? It turned out that when he did the experiment, most of the alpha particles did go straight through, but some of them didn't. Some of them ricocheted off to the side and some of them literally bounced straight back at them. So he correctly concluded that atoms are not like plum pudding. There must be something in the atom that's hard enough to cause these alpha particles to bounce back. And he did some calculations in terms of the size of these hard particles in the atom and the size of the atom itself based on how many reflections he got. And he concluded that First of all, atoms contain a small, hard, positively charged thing in them. And nowadays we call that the nucleus. So this is what caused the deflection of the alpha particles. And then he also said, well, because most of the alpha particles went straight through, the atom is mostly empty space. 
right? And so we can see down here in this diagram what's going on. So the alpha particle goes straight through, goes straight through, but when the alpha particle hits the center of the atom, the nucleus of the atom, then it ricochets and it can ricochet straight back or it might hit the nucleus on the side here and just have a, a glancing ricochet off like that. And so you have all these different possibilities and that very well explained his results. So that led to today's nuclear model of the atom. Basically, the nuclear model states that the nucleus is in the middle and you have electrons that are flying all around and these alpha particles could come in and bump into the nucleus, right? And then ricochet off different directions. But most of the time, the alpha particles are going to go straight through the atom. And this coincides with what we learned earlier, right? We said that the atom is mostly empty space. In fact, the protons and neutrons are so, so small that if the atom was the size of an entire football stadium, you could only just barely see protons and neutrons. They would be about the size of grains of sand, right? And so that's the nuclear model for the atom. In fact, the nucleus and the electrons would be so, so much smaller than they are in this diagram right here. But you get the idea. We want you to be able to see them. The last thing I want to talk about today is isotopes. So isotopes are, as we've already learned, atoms of the same element, but different mass. All right. So same element, but different mass. And how do they get different mass? They get different mass by having different number of neutrons. And your isotopes are always specified by the mass number. So let's look at this. Here is carbon 12. And here's also carbon 12. This is the way to write it out with the name. And this is the symbol of carbon 12. So what is that? The 12 is the mass number, right? All isotopes are specified by their mass number. So that's the, the 12 there. The mass number is the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. And so therefore the mass number is equal to the mass of that atom rounded to the nearest whole number. That six right there is the atomic number. So carbon always has the atomic number six. We remember that the atomic number is equal to the number of protons and that identifies the element. In a neutral atom, the number of electrons and protons are going to be the same. So carbon 12 has six protons and six electrons. And it also happens to have six neutrons because the mass number is number of protons plus neutrons and 12 minus six is six. So six protons, six neutrons, six electrons in carbon 12. Now let's go ahead and do this for another isotope. And so this right here is chlorine 35. And how would we do this? So chlorine 35, well, let's first look it up on your periodic table. So make sure you guys have a periodic table handy that you can look at. Chlorine 35, we can look at the top right of the periodic table and we find chlorine right here. And we notice that this 35.453, that is the atomic weight and its atomic number is 17. So if its atomic number is 17, the symbol of chlorine 35 is going to be chlorine, which is CO, 17 the bottom left and 35 in the top left. Now, how many protons does that have? Well, of course, it's got 17 protons because the atomic number is 17, which tells you how many protons you have. This is neutral. And we know that chlorine here is neutral because there's no charge up here in the top right. So how many electrons did chlorine 35 have? 17, right? Protons and electrons are the same in a neutral atom. Now, what about neutrons? Now, neutrons we get by taking the mass number and subtracting the atomic number. So the mass number is 35, atomic number is 17. So 35 minus 17 is 18 because the mass number is protons plus neutrons. So 18 plus 17 gets you 35. All right, so I want you guys to do this for a number of different isotopes as practice. And that is it for today. So have a great rest of your day.